Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and today we're going to start an extensive series on jazz coordination. For this, we're going to use my book, Advanced Coordination for Drum Set and Hand Percussion. I know a lot of you have it. If you don't, get it. So all the exercises we'll do in this part and the, um, the coming parts will be from this book. Before we start that, let's talk a little about the, um, the ride cymbal pattern. I know most of you know this, so you could skip ahead about a minute. But the original jazz ride cymbal pattern is this. Now, all drummers play that differently. You could normally tell uh, one of the great jazz drummers from their ride pattern from the sound of the cymbal, as well as the way they articulate it and phrase it. In other words, the spacing between the notes. So uh, some of the outstanding ride cymbal players, Philly Joe Jones, Elvin Jones, Roy Haynes, Max Roach, Art Blakey, Jimmy Cobb. Of course, modern players like Jack DeJanette and Tony Williams, more modern, are kind of a conglomerate of some of those players. All of those guys I mentioned have a distinctly different ride cymbal pattern. Some of it is tight, closer together like this. Some of it is really spread out. One thing they all share in common, though, as that ride cymbal gets faster, it gets compressed. And then it almost becomes straight eighth notes, like this. So if you listen to players like Tony Williams, uh, Jack D. Jeanette, like I said before, when those guys play fast, you'll hear that almost straight eighth kind of sound. Some of the great fast drummers, uh, Art Taylor, Max Roach, I went over that in, in my video, the How to Play Fast Jazz video, so go back and reference that. So also, you're going to need to know the actual motions of the hand. So again, everybody does this differently, I'll just show you how I do it. I'll start with one note right in the middle of the cymbal, in other words, about three inches up, but in the middle of the playing area. So we're going to divide this up into three playing areas. The middle, okay, the left, and the right. So I start out right in the middle with one stroke. And then I'm going to move to the left just a little. And I'm going to keep moving to the left until I come back on the third beat. So if you want to think about it more simply, two and four is to the left, towards your hi-hat. So if I play. Now that movement serves a lot of purposes. The number one purpose it serves is you're playing on a different part of the cymbal and relieving buildup. Uh, as you see here, I have a lot of old Ks. Everything here is an old K uh, from the 50s, 1950s, except for this uh, Peisty Swish cymbal. So when you play on these old cymbals, they really will build up uh, as far as vibration and, and they'll, they'll wash out. So the best thing to do is to move that stick so you're distributing the weight on different parts of the cymbal, okay? You can play in one area, and it sounds like this. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But the next purpose it serves is for movement, phrasing, and speed. I guess that's three purposes, but I consider that one all involved in movement. So... If I move like this, for me, it's harder to play faster unless I'm moving my wrist like that. 
and again, I went over a lot of this in that how to play fast video, but it just um, it just needs some going over again because we're going to do some fast stuff today. So the other issue I want to talk about or, or thing I want to talk about is the bass drum. So when we're learning this stuff today, we're just going to be basically using the left hand at first. And when we do that, we want to play almost in an older swing style where the bass drum is playing all four. Okay, so it sounds like this. Just kind of like a walking bass line. Now you don't want to play that too loud. If you play it like this, you're going to ruin the music and, and just make the bass player really mad at you. So you do not want to do that. You want to feather it very light. Now, to help you do that, I brought along a couple of bass drum beaters so you could see what I use. So this is a fluffy beater. Uh, everyone should have one of these. They're great when you're playing a lot of light stuff on the bass drum. Uh, it's a fantastic beater. I first saw Mel Lewis use one of these at the Village Vanguard. Uh, back when I was a kid, I used to go in there. Um, so this is what he used, as well as, well, when I saw him, this is what I saw back there, something like this. I think it was darker, but it was very fluffy. Then we have these wooden beaters, and these are great. This is one Vic Firth makes. I really like it. They also have the round ones that Dan Marr makes. So a wood beater is great for articulate things. Uh, that's kind of what I'm using today as a, as a wood beater. And then you have these double sided DW plastic beaters and then one side is felt, one side is plastic. These are great. And I use these quite a bit as well because you can switch them. So those are the three beaters that I use. And you should have a wood beater, a fluffy beater and a two ended beater, okay? So when you feather that bass drum, it helps to have a fluffy beater. Today I'm not using that. But you need to play very soft, and the way I do that is I lift my heel a little off the pedal and get that beater really close to the head. You'll see there I'm playing some accented notes. That used to be called in the beginning of the bebop age, dropping bombs. Max Roach did it with Charlie Parker. Plenty of other drums. Kenny Clark was one of the first to do that. So uh, you can play louder, but you just need to have that underlying bed of sound. Very soft. So the balance is this. Ride cymbal dominates along with the hi-hat on two and four. Bass drum is whisper soft, and the snare drum comps like a piano player. But the snare drum is under the cymbals, usually, although at times both the bass drum and the snare drum can shout out just to make it interesting. And that was the difference from the bebop, bebop age to the swing age is all of a sudden there was a lot more syncopation. Drummers were no longer playing all four in the bass drum. They were using their bass drum as another drum. And the rhythms got a lot faster as well. All right, and you could hear that music if you listen to early Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie. That'll, that'll give you a good idea of the early... Uh, bebop playing of some of those drummers. So let's get started with some of these jazz coordination exercises. Once again, they're from my book, and we're going to start on page 7. So we're going to interpret these 16th note rhythms as triplets. In other words, regularly they'd be phrased like this. So you see there I'm playing 16th notes and all the rhythms as accents. When we do them as triplets, they're phrased like this. If I play all triplets, it sounds like this. Now that's very important to be able to go from triplets to sixteenths 
to interpret things like that. That's common in the professional music world. So you might see on a chart, play like triplets, and that's what you would do. So all of these today are going to be played like triplets, except when we play really fast, then it'll sound just like it looks on the page. So if we start slow with the metronome, we're going to put that metronome on two and four. So you could put, um, let's say we do it at 100, all right? The real tempo would be 200, but since this is two and four, you'd put it on 100. So I'll show you. Two, four, two, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So that's how I want you to do all of these with the metronome on two and four. Now you saw there that I was playing the snare a little bit louder than I normally would. Normally the balance would be this. Also, you hear that on some of the longer notes, I'm slurring, I'm buzzing. Like that, all right? Now, as we go faster, those notes straighten out a little bit. So let's click up the metronome to 150. That would be 300 in quarter notes. pretty fast but you will need to play that fast so it's good to, to practice that fast it might take you a while to get up to that speed you need to start slow though all right very slow maybe put the metronome on 60 and that would be 120 again two and four now when you get to the second page page eight it gets a little more complicated because you're playing two notes with your left hand so Now, if you watch some of my technique videos on the tradi traditional grip, you'll see the technique that I use. But most of it is fingers. All right? So you'll need to maybe go back and look at that. It's fine to play match grip as well, if that's what you do. So let's try this one with the metronome on two and four, slower. Let's say 200. So you put the metronome on 100, and that would be 2 and 4. That's the first four lines. And again, you saw towards the end that I was starting to slur some of those longer notes. You should do that. So when you're practicing, practicing these things at first, you could be a little more deliberate with the left hand. But again, once you use it in the live context, 
not that loud, like this. Always monitor your bass drum so it's not too loud. Please record yourself and listen. It should just be a kind of a, a pad of sound. If, it, if you take it away, you miss it. It's not there. Let's give you an example of that. So this is with it. You probably hear that when I leave it out, we lose all our low end. But it should never be an articulated thump, always kind of a bed of sound. Good, now let's try this a little faster. Don't go too fast on these, all right? Well, let's say, um, I don't know, like 260 maybe. And you can go even faster if you want. It just becomes tricky physically, so. Sounds like a typewriter. <laughs> All right, good. So the next thing, the next, next logical progression of this would be to introduce your bass drum into the rhythms. So we're kind of evolving into the bebop age. What you want to do is start out slow with page seven. And well, there's two ways you could do this. Let's give you the first way that you can do it. And this is normally the way that I start teaching it, but if the student has problems, I go back to this another way, which I'll show you as well. The first way is to alternate each note. So in other words, it would sound like this. So you see there, each note is on um, a different uh, drum, snare drum, bass drum, snare drum, bass drum. If that's giving you trouble, you can do this. So that's the first line. So I know it sounds a little like a country, country tune, but uh, that will help you develop your bass drum under the cymbal line, which is what you want to do. And that's not a bad thing to do. It's just normally I just start out with that alternating thing. So let's talk a little about that. Uh, the bass drum and the snare drum now should be evenly matched volume-wise, but still under the cymbal and the hi-hat. So if we do this at quarter note equals 200, it should sound like this. Again, I'm overemphasizing the bass drum and the snare drum there. Now, when you play it faster, it starts sounding pretty interesting. So you can play these pretty fast. We can go all the way up. Let's see if I can do it. 
all the way up to 300. I'll try. tough. So you see there that sometimes I'm playing more bass drum notes, more snare drum notes. That's all good. Every time you do it, it should be a little bit different. All right? When we do page eight, it becomes even more complicated because now you're playing faster rhythms, alternating. So let's try that at quarter note equals uh, 200 again. So remember, two and four at all times. So here we go with this. Now, if we do that faster, not too fast, say around 280. That's, that's actually a lot of fun. That's the way I would suggest you work on the first part of your jazz coordination. Now, don't fret. This might take a long time. This might take two or three months to get comfortable with this. And of course, if you don't have the technical ability physically to play these things fast, that's going to take a lot longer. So if you have the chops to do it, the coordination aspect is going to be a little bit easier. Just make sure your balances are correct. That's the most important thing. So that'll do it for part one. Now, part two, we're going to get into uh, the rest of the exercises in the book, and there's lots of them. Uh, the first, in part two, we're going to do triplets. So uh, quarter note triplets, eighth note triplets. And then in part three, we're going to do triplets and sixteenths and hi-hat coordination. It gets pretty crazy.